welcome back. Um, it is a busy time of the year. Everything is just thawing out. Things are actually starting to bloom now. And that means that we basically have to get on propagation. Anything that we can dig up, that we can split bulbs, the stuff that we stool mounded last year. We'll talk about that on this episode. What stool mounding? How can you multiply your plants for free? Let's get into an early spring propagation video. Stick around. So it's been really weird weather. It's been cold. Um, it was warm maybe two month, two weeks ago. Now it's cold again. Our wood chip pile actually still has ice in it. So <laughs> can you see the ice? Like it's still frozen solid. Um, so everything's kind of frozen, but at the same time, parts of my soil are melted and thawed out and we can actually dig some of the stuff up but it's so warm today it's actually 18 celsius today um, and we have got stuff popping up we've got garlic popping up um, we've got currants that are starting to blossom or uh, leaf out we've got the service berry that is already starting to break bud and we've got our has caps as well um, maybe not this one, yeah, this one a little bit, that are actually starting to put out leaves. So that means that we have got to get propagating this stuff. So one of my favorite spring plants is actually daffodils for a really early blooming flower. You'll see I still have ice in the ground in spots and this daffodil is actually putting on flower right now. And anywhere that we have these clumps They'll kind of tend to clump out and naturalize. So anywhere we have these clumps here, we can dig those up and split them. And I've been splitting them all morning long and I thought, man, I better go grab my camera and do a video. But at the same time, I just gotta get this stuff done. And here, look at this, in a slightly sunnier position, these ones are already fully bloomed. So this is pretty fun. Uh, the season is starting. So anytime that I see them bloomed like that, I'm actually not gonna divide them. Those ones are basically stuck like that for the year. I'm not gonna touch them again. I'll only divide the ones that are just popping out. Okay, and similarly, uh, anywhere I planted garlic last year that I missed the bulb, typically because I planted them too deep, I'll see stuff like this. So I'll see this big patch of garlic. And these I can also dig up right now and we can propagate those. So these are super easy to propagate. We basically just split them apart. Okay, we'll get the sky as the backdrop there. So we basically can just pull them apart. Now I find anything like this, daffodils, if you kind of grab half of them at any time and you just kind of gently tease them apart, they come apart quite easily. And then you just kind of move them relative to each other carefully. You don't want to split too many of the roots and then you just divide them out like that. And you know, this is not the best way to grow garlic in a clump that you left, but that's still a whole bunch of garlic. So you can see that I've been spreading them. So anywhere that I had some garlic planted, I you know, pulled out the clump, put one or two back in the spot and then spread them all over the place. Year with all the propagating and spreading that I just did, plus the fall planting last year, I've got to have at least 2,000 garlic in my food forest. And I'm probably only going to get a thousand of them. I basically, we'll look for when the stalk kind of gets flimsy and falls over. These are all soft neck. Um, and then, you know, next year it'll be the same thing. Now, daffodils I already did this morning, so I don't have any video footage of it. I've kind of gone around and gotten all of them. I put a bunch near the pond, um, but they're the same idea. And then you just yank them out, try to get as much root as you can, and then peel apart each clove and then just kind of peel them apart. If you look at my daffodil video from last year, you'll see more uh, in-depth of actually how to pull them apart, but it's not really hard. So here's an area I was saving old cedar fence rails to maybe use another uh, in another fence one day. And I did plant a couple raspberries in there maybe two years ago. And you can see they've already started dividing. They've started spreading. 
So each one of these, I can dig them up and there'll be a whole new cluster of plants. So raspberries are another good opportunity to divide out. And once you get a couple little patches established, they'll just keep multiplying like this. So this whole area are a bunch of raspberry plants that, you know, I can put down near the pond or somewhere else. Um, but just remember, they do spread. So wherever you do put them, you're gonna have raspberries popping up. They're not super aggressive. You know, this is two years here of spread. And you know, if I just came and mowed this once, that would be it for the season, um, but they will spread. So just be aware that they will actually spread. Rhubarb. Rhubarb coming up. That's another plant you can split. Uh, rhubarb you split kind of like hostas. You basically just dig the whole plant up. You drive a shovel right down the center of the root uh, and then you basically just fracture it into two, three plants and plant each one and it's super easy. And just on the whole spreading thing, a lot of people will say, oh my gosh, don't plant, you know, this or that because it spreads. Strawberries, they creep, they're a ground cover, they'll spread, raspberries spread, you know. Sometimes that's, you know, really important to listen to, like, you know, Pacific Northwest with blackberries, in the UK with blackberries, stuff like that. Um, but in general, food that wants to spread, I mean... <laughs> That's a good thing. I mean, that's what we're trying to get here. So that's one of the reasons why I like some of these plants so much is that they do spread vigorously, but they won't really take over an ecosystem. I think that's the real important thing. They won't necessarily displace plants, um, but they will multiply. So look for stuff like that that spreads, but it's like an 8 out of 10 in spreading. It's not like a 10 out of 10 take over a whole entire you know country. Okay, so here's my blackberries, and this is a plant that tip layers really well. So let's talk about tip layering. These are basically canes that will leap, run, and then fall over, and they want to hit the ground. And when they hit the ground, they'll actually root into the ground. So you can see this one I tip layered, but a rabbit de tip layered it for me. Um, but uh, this original plant, I only had one, this is a thornless blackberry. And um, when it was small, you know, how small is this? That was the reach of it. it I took it and I tip layered one of them. And now I've got kind of two main mother plants here. And uh, you can see I've done other tip layering, like here, for example. So this was an old shoot that came in and I tip layered it. And now it's actually, I think it came in from this side here. And then I tip layered it. And then now it's pushing out new green uh, growth here so I could dig this plant out and this is a brand new plant you can see some of the other tip layering I've done here so going straight into the ground probably actually from this cane the old dead one straight into the ground rooted shot out a new plant that I can divide and it's you know it's leafing out and we've got a couple more in here so these are ways you can turn one plant into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of plants you know another one here but if I did want to get into this for propagation and selling plants, you know, blackberry is a really good one to propagate and sell. But again, just be cautious of something like blackberry. And if you're in an area where these can be a big problem, obviously, you know, don't go into business selling plants that are a problem. So this is another reason I haven't really sold these. I can manage and control this. I trust myself to do that. Um, we get most of the berries, anything that falls I clean up so the birds don't really get any and they kind of eat other stuff. So I can control this really, really well and it's not super crazy invasive here at all. I mean, it's not even on the invasive list and it's a thornless one. So, you know, it's like a 7 out of 10 here for spreading. Um, so I do grow it, but I'm not really I'm going to go selling it or anything like that, but I do propagate it just in case I wanted to divide it out and put it somewhere else. Okay, so here's another way that you can um, propagate some of your bush plants especially. And that's basically any bush that sends a ton of shoots out, you know, right at ground level, like a hascap. Hascaps are great because they root readily into soil. Um, you can basically, like... 
you can basically mound dirt around them and they'll root into that. So each branch will root into it and then you can, you know, dig it up or just get, peel the dirt back and cut them below the roots. Um, and we'll do that today. And that way, you know, each branch becomes a brand new hascap bush in this case. So what I normally do is I'll stool mound them and then I'll actually dig the whole bush out and I'll plant one of the branches, like the strongest, the nicest one back in the original spot. What I'm going to try this year maybe is I'm going to try to wash away some of this soil and see if I can do it that way and leave the core of the plant intact and then pull out the side ones. So, so let's get going. Let's get trying to see if we can um, do this in the least destructive ways possible. Because this is actually one of my favorite Hascap bushes. Okay, so one, that was cool. Two, wasn't that a cool experiment on showing how roots hold hills together and prevent erosion really well? It was really, really neat to see the force that I dumped that water on top of this Hascap bush. And it's still, you know, look at the roots are basically still clinging on to parts of soil. Um, that was like a pretty intense dumping of a water bucket and for the most part there wasn't really that much erosion around So it kind of didn't work, but that's also kind of cool at the same time Like I think kind of really cool So look at this living soil Sorry, dude Okay, so I think I got two options here. I can basically either stick with my original plan and dig it up and split the plants. And I think that maximizes the chance of each plant surviving. Or I can drive a shovel in, try to kind of work away and cut this a little below each root mass, each branch a little below the roots that it put on. And the problem with that is when I drive the shovel in, I'm still going to be you know, severing roots of whatever I leave in there. And then I'm gonna be also severing the roots of the ones that I'm pulling out. So I think, I think I'm just gonna bite the bullet and dig this up as usual. Plus that'll be fun. Yeah, I think I'll do that. Actually, let's go look at the ones from last year. Actually, no, <laughs> sorry. Let's do this first because the roots are exposed. So let's get this dug up and planted. All right, we don't have much time, so I'm just gonna get busy doing this. Sorry that I have to do this quickly. Uh, I just need to maximize the chance of this plant surviving. Okay, so what you wanna try to do is each little segment of the plant you cut out, you wanna try to find where it joins to this other plant without doing too much damage. You're going to do a ton of damage to the roots, but that's okay. You know, look at these roots. It's amazing. So you're going to do a little bit of damage, but you want to do just minimize the damage you're going to do. So we're going to try to pull away and see where this attaches. And then we're going to use a pair of pruners we don't really care that much for. Um, because anytime you prune with dirt in it, you're going to dull your pruners or knives or whatever really fast. So I think I can kind of find it and then we'll try to cut it there. Okay, so I just needed to get that done. I have one left. I'll show you what the root system looks like. I only got about five this year and I left a really big bush maybe for next year. I have a lesson that I learned and I'll, I'll show you what that is. 
first let's look at the one that we have left so you know what you're looking to get okay so the other ones I got in the ground because they're drying out and I'm basically soaked them in the pond water and this is kind of about what you want let's zoom out there so that's kind of about what you want that plant should have no problem surviving um, and uh, so we'll go get this in the ground this one will definitely do good so I'd probably turn one plant into about five maybe four because maybe one won't make it maybe two won't make it but still three for one in your plant on a mistake here and uh, I think that's pretty good okay if you look at this one and how much non like where I had to cut it right there and how much root I have I normally want to have more of like a tap root like it's a branch but a tap root at the bottom um, and this is because I didn't stool mount it high enough this year so I think next year I'll go like a solid two feet stool mound uh, but this one's still great like this will be a great healthy plant but I wasn't able to get as many because I didn't have good rooting before the roots or before the branches joined into the crown so if you don't stool mount it high enough then all the roots that are where the stool mound was um, because the crown is down here where I cut it so the crown was down there and then this was all soil up to basically this level there so this was all under soil I think I'd go another two feet and the reason why this one did so well sorry let's turn this is because this is the orientation of the branch it was almost sideways so even though I didn't stool mount it very high it had a lot of soil to root into where some of the other branches that were straight up they didn't have enough root mass to realistically divide so I just kept it on the plant okay so show you where we planted that one and you for those of you who watch my channel often you'll notice something different here we've started to spread this out further onto the lawn so we've got a couple peaches um, that I had in the back so we moved them up to a higher value location right close to the house so that's a good lesson learned and we've got the has cap um, the best one that I showed you that was the best one um, the best one is right in the front so that anytime I show you this clip which I tend to film this the most uh, you'll get to see how it's doing so if it dies you'll know if it dies you'll know right away I'll show you where some of the other ones that were put okay so the other ones that I didn't think had very good roots I put them kind of on the north edge of the property just in low value spots um, so there's one here this is basically going down to the lower bin lower garden and then we've got uh, one here and one here and then we've got one here and then we've got one way in the far side so that's it for the propagations this year let's actually look at some of the ones we did last year and see if they're taking right next to this stump kind of on the north edge of the house uh, we've got two from last year and they were just small uh, but they're actually leafing out again so that means they survived all summer being ignored completely and then also survived our winter so we've got one there and we've got one here right there that survived just small ones from last year and one there so we've got three right here that survived. Those three were there. Uh, we've got another one here. This one survived. And like I said, these are completely ignored. That one survived. So these were absolutely 100% ignored all year. Weren't watered whatsoever. Here was a nicer big one that I gave it a little bit more room. Survived. Another one. See, so the stool layering does definitely work. So last year we turned a whole bunch of plants, or we, we turned one plant into a whole bunch, survived. So pretty good, pretty good numbers. And this was the plant that we stool layered last year. So you can see about how big it is. It was obviously a little smaller last year. 
And last year I basically, instead of digging it up, I sliced right down through the center of it and pulled those cuttings off of. So the plant survived, it'll balance itself out again in time. Um, but you know, it, it's all about free replicating your money for free. And to me, as long as this survived and the others did also, you know, even though the plants won't get to like 10, 12 feet as fast, if I can multiply them early, you know, I'm still super early in doing my food forest. This is only year four, I think. So if I can get free multiplication happening, then I'm going to do that. And I think that's a worthwhile pursuit. Okay, so remember, with all of these techniques where you're propagating from cuttings, where you're propagating from splitting a plant, dividing a bulb, stool layering, tip layering, air grafting, and um, even like scion wood, like graft grafting, remember that you're actually cloning the genetics of the plant. And why this matters, I'll use Hascaps as an example. Hascaps um, has male and female flowers on the same plant. However, there's something called semi-fertile, which means that if you have multiple varieties of the plant, you'll get bigger and better uh, fruit and the plants will be healthier in general. So before you start thinking you're gonna buy like one plant of each type and then divide your food forest out and grow it for free, just remember that you wanna get you know multiple varieties of specifically some plants. I would just go with all plants, get multiple varieties of them. So you have a bit of a um, diversity in your genetics and then you can divide those out and you're not just cloning the same thing. So. Cloning is a great way, uh, you know, all these propagation techniques is a great way to get free plants. It's a great way to minimize the cost of a food forest installation, but just remember that you are cloning the genetics. So more baby garlic as a companion to this service berry that's just blooming out. We've got some heather that's a very early blooming plant and you can see little pollinating insects all hovering around it. So, um, this one here is non-edible, but it's actually a fantastic plant for pollinators. New mulch added to the side of this hill that was bare soil. I do like to leave a little bare soil. Um, a really kind watcher was telling me that uh, bees actually will, some wild native bees will nest in bare soil. So I do keep some patches. So we've got some bare soil up here um, where the you know the leafing out of the sumax will prevent too much erosion for having the bare soil and then uh, we've got garlic all around this cherry okay this lower wild garden here um, we're going to move it into perennials probably plant some nut trees down here this year i'm not going to get down here as often um, i just naturally don't especially with the pond now we're up there a lot so i want stuff in here that's extremely low maintenance so that's you know onions and garlic so this is another area where we spread all that garlic. This garlic is all free. So, I mean, this is just, you know, free food coming up everywhere. This is all divided out from previous years. So this whole area is a cluster of daffodils. I put a new peach tree in here that I grew from a seed. So this is its third year. So we're gonna put that right next to the pond. We've got more daffodils all growing up the side here. We've got them all into the hill of this so that when you're looking at the gazebo, which is over there, the view this way is just this big, you know, patch of daffodils. Okay, so I think that's it for the video. I have a lot to do, so I'm gonna probably maybe divide some of this creeping thyme out, spread it out, you know, the more little centers and nodes of stuff you can get all spreading, the faster the space will close in. So I'm gonna keep doing this. I'm gonna just work on it all day long.